My name is Ben. I work at Google in Munich on WebAssembly. It's a project I started three years ago with some colleagues at, actually not colleagues, but uh, some collaborators at Mozilla. And since then, many people have been involved. My colleague Andreas Rosberg also works at Google. We're going to give a half and half presentation, so we're going to switch off in the middle. So you can stand there and be creepy if you like, <laughs> or you can sit. Um, but I'll go ahead and begin. <laughs> Yes, you can stand up and slap me if I say something wrong. Uh, okay, so I'm going to talk about what WebAssembly is, why we did WebAssembly, why it's like that. Actually, the why is going to be more Andreas's uh, task to describe. And we're going to talk about where it's going. So what is WebAssembly? What we've designed is basically a bytecode for the web. It's designed to be portable across machines, across platforms, um, so that you can write a program and get the sort of run, write once, run anywhere uh, kind of promise that Java had. Um, it's designed to be compact, and to be compact it's a binary format. So you don't see text unless you disassemble a binary. In order to be universal, it has a low-level execution model. In particular, we wanted to support languages like C++ because we observed that many people had their C++ applications, such as games, and were already compiling them to the web and running them in JavaScript. So there was already a use case that we wanted to support, so we had to make sure that it worked well. Nowadays, which is really great for me to be able to say this, it's natively supported in all major browsers. That means Chrome, Firefox, Safari, and Edge. We developed in, in, under the auspices of a W3C community group, which basically allows anyone to join and comment. Um, and also, we have a working group, which is a more formal body, which sort of, um, they actually approve final specifications. The idea is that we didn't want to reinvent the web platform, but integrate with the web platform. So any API that you have, um, for example, that's available in JavaScript, you can get to through WebAssembly. So there's a lot of users already, and many potential users coming. So we've shown demos, including Google Earth, uh, the Unity 3D engine, which many, many games, uh, both on Android and on the web, use. Uh, but CAD applications, Farmville 2, which makes money for uh, Zynga, uh, audio editing and things like that. All these things are now coming to the web and WebAssembly is the execution technology for them. I'm going to talk about the basics of the technology. So all code in WebAssembly comes in larger groups of what we call modules. A module is basically a group of related functions. It can be as large as a whole executable or it can be as small as a DLL. You can also make a module as small as a single function if you like. A module always imports the functionality that it needs from outside. So anything besides running pure computation and accessing memory, anything that would be I.O., anything that would be networking, anything that would be displaying graphics, that has to be explicitly imported into a module. What that gives us is a separation to say that WebAssembly code can be sandboxed. So you add the external functionality. It can also be embedded in other scenarios besides the web, but in particular the web gives us the capabilities to talk to the DOM, for example, but always through JavaScript imports. A module is not an actual program that's executing. It has no state. It instead is like a declaration. You can consider it analogous to the text of your program. It's not an actually running program. In order to get it running, you have to in instantiate it. That creates something that does have state. And I'll talk about in detail what the state is, um, but it's basically a large memory and also local variables, global variables. So an instance is the running program, so to speak. So to put that in pictures, just because uh, slides full of text are boring, um, you, I'm now using green boxes to represent modules. A module basically, again, has just functions inside. Everything that it needs from outside is explicitly imported. <clears throat> and it can also export functions, so anything which is functionality, such as the main function or subroutines to decode images or whatever that module's role is, are exports. Uh, instantiation produces an instance, and the instance has the actual live data in it. So I'm going to talk about the binary format. Um, for those of you interested in bytes and bits, um, just to give you some context, you don't have to memorize this, uh, hopefully that you're not actually writing WebAssembly using the raw bytes. Um, but it's basically very simple. It's just a series of sections that come in in a specific order. Each section has a byte, which tells you what type it is. 
Um, we use a vari variable length encoding. <clears throat> that gives us future proofing, so if we have much larger modules in the future. Um, we're basically limited to four gigabyte modules now, but you can imagine all limits sort of go away in the fullness of time. Uh, function bodies, which are basically the meat of your program, the code, is a stack machine. Um, and that code is represented as bytecode, so it's very dense. So it looks basically like this. We have these codes which come in order. Uh, a module first declares all the signatures of functions that it's going to be using uh, in the first section, because those will be referred to by later sections. Imports come next, so you can already, within the first two sections, you can tell what functions signatures will be there, what types, and also what a module imports. And then we get to function declarations, which are functions that are inside this module and defined inside this module. The indirect table is how we do indirect calls. I won't, not important to get into the details of that. Memory configuration talks about how big the memory is that this module expects um, and other properties of it. Globals are global variables. Exports are the functions that will be exported from this module and therefore be available outside the module. Um, there's also an initialization function which you can specify. Um, the indirect tables can be initialized that's the next section after that. Then the main section after that is the function bodies, which includes bytecode. And then there's some uh, initializable, initialization data for memory. So you can have some part of your binary basically gets loaded into memory at the start. So proportionally speaking, most of the, most of the binary is going to be the function bodies. It's going to be code. We've observed about 90% of the modules in the wild uh, are comprised of code. And then, of course, it depends. You can add custom sections to a binary. Those things are ignored by the engine, or the, execute, the, the engine that executes your binary. And you can add them at the end or sprinkle them in the middle. Um, and obviously, the propor proportions will change uh, with how much extra uh, sections that you add. OK, so I'm going to talk about <clears throat> the execution model now. So above this sort of dashed red line in the middle of the slide, that's application state. That's state that your program can actually change by executing instructions. Things below the line you cannot directly change nor address. And this is basically how we accomplish sandboxing. So if you can imagine, if you think to x86, if you think all the way down at the machine level, you can address the stack and you can smash the stack. And that's a huge security vulnerability. We didn't want that for the web. That would be terrible. So instead, the call stack is something that you cannot directly address. You cannot, no bug in your program can cause the call stack to become corrupted. Similarly, with the indirect function table, which is how we do indirect calls, that cannot be corrupted by your program. The function representations, whatever they look like inside the actual WebAssembly engine, you cannot get to them. And that's by design. Instead, the state that we give you to play with in your program uh, is basically a large byte array. It sounds almost uh, silly when you put it that way, but it's basically an emulation of a machine. WebAssembly is a machine. So you can literally put any bits that you want into the memory. But that memory is separated from all the other memory in the process or the embedding. So you can't get to the browser state through the linear memory. That's only private to the program. The other state that we have is global variables, and those you cannot address indirectly, you have, must always specify an index. So you can't corrupt the global variables by having an errant pointer in your C program, for example. I'll talk about the instruction set. We have four basic types. They're all simple, uh, primitive types. So we have 32-bit integers, 64-bit integers, 32-bit floating point numbers, and 64-bit floating point numbers. Integers do not have a sign. Instead, we put the sign on operations. This is the same way like a machine works. So x86 does not define that a 32-bit register has a sign. Instead, there are operations that treat the high order bit as signed or not. Instructions are, you can group them roughly by the types of values they, they manipulate. Um, so we have addition and subtraction and things like that for each of uh, these primitive types. But we also have instructions which are polymorphic or they're sort of parameterized over types. So accessing local variables, global variables, and the memory, all of those you can load different types. Uh, and then to accomplish function calls, we have bytecodes for calling functions directly, where you specify an index, F calling functions indirectly, that's where this table comes from. This is where you specify computed index, uh, returning from a function. And then local control flow is done with uh, blocks, ifs, and loops. So instead of having jumps and branches in your code, you actually have structured control flow constructs.
Okay, so now we get to actually look at the bytes if you're interested. Um, so we have a text format for WebAssembly code. You can take any binary and, and disassemble it to that text format. You can also go what, the other direction, take the text format and go to the binary. Um, just to be clear, this is more like disassembling x86 machine code. This is not like going back to your program's original code. We don't expect people to write the text format um, to write their programs this way. Instead, they compile into WebAssembly. Um, but I'll show you kind of some various highlights about how we about how the binary format works. So on the left, we have an add function. It has two parameters. We declare their types as i32. We declare its result type as i32. And then inside the function, we have this, in the text format, we have this syntax which looks a bit like Lisp, which is S expressions. Um, you can, we're adding the two, we're getting the, the values of those two local variables, and then just adding them and returning that. There's an implicit return, um, so if you fall off the end of the code with a value, um, that gets returned from the function. So in the binary, what we have is a selection of what shows up in various sections. So in the type section, we have to have a declaration of that function signature type. This is how it looks. 60 in hex actually means, hey, this is a function type. 2 is the number of parameters. Then 7f is int, which you should probably not memorize. But, <laughs> and then there's one return value. And that's actually future proof for adding more return values in the future. So that's how we describe this type. And then in the function declaration section, we just have a series of their types. The only thing that we have to declare with the function is its type, and we use an index into the type section. So we have one function, it's type number zero, which happens to be that. And then the function body, we have one function body, its length is seven, so that blue number there is actually a variable length encoding of the number seven. It could actually be one byte, but in this example, uh, it's padded. And then the function body comes next. It tells you that we have zero additional local variables. It tells, and then we have the actual bytecodes. So the bytecodes come in execution order. Two, 20 in hex is get local, which you should also memorize. Um, and then the, the local variable indices. So the actual meat of this program is only the seven byte uh, body, which is quite a bit shorter than the text format, obviously. Okay, so I'm gonna talk about how we embed WebAssembly. We had a very clear goal that we wanted to separate the execution core of WebAssembly from how it's embedded in another program in another setting. So I mentioned that, I mentioned x86 a couple of times. It's, you can think of WebAssembly as being anal analogous to an instruction set architecture. x86 doesn't have I.O. functions. It doesn't have a graphics card that's part of the instruction set. Instead, that's all provided by a layer of software above. WebAssembly is very similar. We call all that layer above the embedding. Um, so that layer provides the ability to load and instantiate modules, link modules, so imports and exports being connected together, and also import host functionality. So again, like I.O. functions, accessing, frame buffers, whatever you like. That's all in a layer above WebAssembly. So we've defined a very clear separation on purpose for doing that. The most important embedding is definitely JavaScript. So WebAssembly can be embedded in a JavaScript execution context. And in fact, in V8, in Chrome, that's how it's implemented. It's in, embedded in the JavaScript API. And then that is embedded further in the web. So there's actually more layers above WebAssembly. So the JavaScript APIs, allow us to load and instantiate modules and get access to other APIs in JavaScript to do all those fun things with the screen and the DOM. We can also call WebAssembly from JavaScript. And the key idea is that WebAssembly doesn't add any new API surface to the web. Other than the APIs for manipulating WebAssembly, it doesn't fundamentally change what you can do with the web. So just to make that a picture, because again, text is boring, um, We've got our module here, actually an instance here. Uh, it's got its code and data inside. The only way that it can get to the outside, the only way it can get to the console or do I.O. is through imported functions. That means that the outside world can sort of interpose and make sure that uh, WebAssembly module doesn't escape its sandbox, so to speak. Okay, so we can have explicitly imported JavaScript functions. You can think of this blackness around as the void, which is JavaScript. Um, we can have explicitly imported JavaScript functions, and we have an API, which I'll show in the next slide or two slides, um, what that looks like to load and validate the, mo the modules. And then when a 
a function is exported from a WebAssembly module, it's just callable from JavaScript, like another JavaScript function. We can also export the, the actual data, the memory, the linear memory that I mentioned in the other slide. We can actually get to that from JavaScript. That's optional. That's basically a way that you can do zero copy I.O. with JavaScript in the web platform. So um, this is what the JavaScript API looks like. There's a WebAssembly object which is in the outermost JavaScript context and everything hangs off that. We have types which represent modules. So this is an opaque representation where you take the bytes and you decode that to a WebAssembly.module instance and then from JavaScript you can create the next thing which is a WebAssembly.instance and that actually has the state. Um, the memories and tables you can actually create and manipulate from JavaScript uh, through the API and that's I won't get into that, but you can accomplish a kind of dynamic linking that way. Um, there's also an synchronous and asynchronous APIs in JavaScript for doing these things. Uh, for example, the constructors that take bytes, those are synchronous. Those will not complete until that operation is done. For example, compiling or parsing the bytes. But the asynchronous APIs give you a promise back so that you can go back to the main event loop and then the promise will complete when that operation is done. Now I'd like to hand it over to my colleague, Andreas, for the rest of it. Yeah, so at this point, we could give you all sorts of examples of how you use that WebAssembly and how you write code, how the code looks. And I mean, Ben gave some simple examples, but the, the basic idea is you shouldn't ever be doing that, right? You shouldn't be writing WebAssembly code by hand. So there isn't much point in actually showing much of that in the presentation here. Rather, instead of doing that, um, I want to give you some more high-level background about why we did WebAssembly and why we did it the way we did it and where it's heading. Um, so, okay, so obviously one of the goals of WebAssembly was to provide high performance to the web. I mean, with JavaScript these days, you can get pretty good. They are amazingly fast if, if you hit the, the good cases, but it's, it all depends on actually hitting the good cases, right? So um, actually more important than just performance in general is that this performance is predictable. So that was one of the main goals of WebAssembly to provide, provide you with predictable performance models. Um, another important goal for us is actually basically let me call it breaking the JavaScript monopoly on the web, right? So there are a gazillion languages that compile to the web these days, but if, if any of you who's a compiler writer will probably realize that JavaScript is like a horrible compilation target and you have to jump through all sorts of hoops and it's going to be inefficient in many cases to compile a random language to JavaScript. So for WebAssembly we wanted to have this universal uh, format that you can compile any language to in a reasonable manner. Um, and what comes with that also is the ability to add features and have languages that compile to the web uh, support features that JavaScript does not support and probably won't ever support. So one early example of a feature that JavaScript currently doesn't support is like in 64 native uh, types. Other things are uh, threads in, in some way and SIMD, for example, we're going to add at some point and things like that. Um, tail calls is another interesting example I could talk about for quite a while. Um, so yeah, it, it gives us a new way of adding features to the web where, where JavaScript would get in the way. Um, and one other thing, uh, I guess some of you are aware of like previous technologies that existed like ASMJS was kind of like a predecessor of WebAssembly and that was done by Mozilla and, and Google had this technology called native client where you could actually ship uh, x86 or uh, in, in portable NACL it was uh, LLVM bitcode to the web. Um, but all these technologies had their issues and weren't widely adopted and one, one reason to do WebAssembly is to unify them into one thing that everybody supports. And it's uh, maybe interesting to know that all the, the people who worked on ASMJS and on NACL before are all working on WebAssembly these days. Um, so we designed this thing, I gave you some reasons why we want to do it and, and obviously that comes with a number of design goals and also design constraints. So there's a whole list of them, um, I just 
give them here. I don't want to go through all of them, but obviously uh, some of these we already mentioned before, like it's supposed to be language independent, it's supposed to be platform independent, which on the web, or hardware independent, which on the web uh, is an obvious goal. By platform independent, I actually mean it's not dependent on the web or JavaScript either, and I will get back to that. And then, yeah, of course, you want it to be fast to execute. You want it to be safe, which is also important on the web. And the lower two bits are uh, properties we wanted to have for this. Uh, yeah, it should have nice properties. It should be predictable in, in various semantic dimensions. So this is all about the, the semantics of WebAssembly as a language, if you want. Um, but there's a, another dimension that uh, Ben also already mentioned, which is the representation dimension. So it's also important because you transfer this, uh, these binaries, these modules over the wire, that they are compact, right? Because that is where, where time is spent and, and probably your, your budget um, for your mobile contract. So it, it's really important that it's compact, but then also we want to generate just-in-time compile native code. So it's designed to make that easy so that we can e decode it fast, that we can com compile it fast, that we can validate it fast. And on top of that, uh, the whole binary format is designed in a way that even makes it possible to start compiling without having seen the whole thing yet. So you can actually stream and compile, like while the bytes are still coming in, you can start compiling some of the functions. And you can parallelize out compilation of separate functions. So the whole binary format and the order of sections you saw on Ben's slide was chosen particular uh, to, to make these things possible. Um, so did we achieve these goals? Well, it's in general, it's probably a bit early to tell, but we have some preliminary numbers. So we, we wrote a, a paper that we uh, submitted to a, to a scientific conference uh, earlier this year, which is called PLDI, where we had a, a number, a couple of, of graphs. So this is one of them, which is about performance. Um, there's actually a lot to see in that graph. I'm, I'm not gonna explain everything, but it shows uh, like execution time, compile time, and validation time, and VM startup for uh, various individual benchmarks from, from a larger benchmark suit called Polybench uh, Poly C. Um, and the, the blue bar is probably the most important one. Actually, first, what, what, what is the percentage on the left? That is the comparison to uh, execution time for the same program. So these are C programs, essentially. Uh, when running on in compiled as C programs to native code offline on the on the same machine, and this is like showing how how performant WebAssembly is in comparison when you compile that to WebAssembly and then run that on the same machine. So wherever we are uh, at hundred percent, we have basically reached native code performance. So as you can see, uh, we are not quite there yet everywhere, but. Um, for most of these benchmarks, at least, we're getting pretty close. I mean, these are benchmarks. You always have to be careful with benchmarks. In reality, it's more often like that we are 50% or 100% over. So up to 2x is currently more like realistic to expect for, for your uh, application when you compile to WebAssembly. But um, this is very early days, and we expect that to still improve. So one other thing you can see there is, as well, or actually can't see is one, one kind of bar there is, so these are all stacked, is validation. So that is the time it takes to validate the bytecode, so what the JVM calls bytecode verification. And you can actually see that it doesn't show up there. So one of the, uh, because it's so tiny, it's so fast that it doesn't actually matter. So that was also an important design goal to make validation very fast. Um, so that is about performance uh, in terms of time. And then I, I talked about code being compact. So code size is another important dimension. So this is another graph from the same paper. And it's a scatter graph that plots uh, the size of, of the same programs in either ASMJS or in x86 uh, SM, uh, machine code, sorry, machine code against its size in WebAssembly. And the diagonal is basically where they, they are equal size. So anything that is below the diagonal, where most of the points lie, fortunately, says that the WebAssembly representation is smaller than either. So yellow would be the, uh, the ASMJS representation, and blue dots are the native code representation. So wherever they are below the diagonal, that means that WebAssembly is smaller.
So that was important for us to measure that we actually have achieved this goal. Um, how did we achieve that? I, I don't really want to go much into implementation here, just a couple of things to say here what engines do. Um, so first thing to, to note is that at least in browsers, WebAssembly is actually not like a whole new thing that is in the browser. It's actually just implemented as part of the existing JavaScript engines. So it really reuses lots of the infrastructure that the JavaScript engines already have, in particular much of the compilation pipeline and the memory management and all that. And that also has the advantage that calling back and forth between WebAssembly and JavaScript is like really fast. We can make that really fast. So there's, even though you have to go through JavaScript to, for example, manipulate the DOM or use WebGL or anything, that shouldn't actually be a significant overhead. Um, yeah, and there are, so there's this one design we have which is implemented in various browsers and uh, one thing to know is also that this design is kind of general in that it allows various different implementation strategies. And right now all the browsers use actually somewhat different strategies to implement it. Uh, in particular, one, one interesting dimension is like how many compilation or optimization tiers you have in your pipeline. Um, so this is something that is uh, like very important when you compile JavaScript, you usually have several levels of optimization, which means several compilers. So you start with the simple one that is fast so that you that startup times are minimized and once code becomes hot, you recompile it with a more optimizing compiler. And these are strategies that also apply uh, to WebAssembly. Um, they're maybe somewhat less important because the code format is much uh, lower level, so you can compile it more directly. You don't have to do all the crazy shit that you have to do for JavaScript. But still, it can make a difference between, like, uh, in, especially in terms of startup times, it's really important. Um, uh, yeah, and then there are various uh, textbook optimizations uh, that we apply in these in this just-in-time compilers in the engines um, and other tricks that I won't go into here. Um, so this is the engine side, but how do you actually produce WebAssembly? Um, I mean, Ben mentioned it, the, the idea is that you compile to it, right? You don't write it manually, you compile to it. And uh, you can do that from whatever language you want, as long as you find somebody who works writing a compiler for you, right? So our first big customers uh, are C and C++, of course, uh, most of them being prior users of ASMJS already. So that is currently at least done mostly through the mscripten pipeline. And then there's a, quite a significant effort to have a Rust compiler targeting WebAssembly. And there are various other like uh, projects going on already from s ranging from some real toy stuff to something real serious. So we really hope to see like tons of, of new languages coming to the web in, in the near future. Um, and uh, that is kind of like the, the, the obvious thing. You just compile something offline and then run it. But one important goal for WebAssembly also is to be even more versatile so that you can uh, support platforms like say the JVM or .NET that actually use JIT compilation themselves, right? So that you can implement those on top of what WebAssembly does. So there are some implementation efforts already being started in that direction, but we don't have any real, real good experience with that right now. Just pointing out that this was also a design goal to support that. Um, yeah, so this all flows into this overarching goal that this is really supposed to be a language independent uh, format. Um, so yeah, producing WebAssembly, the, the other side, the engine briefly Getting back to that is the what we call the consumer of WebAssembly, um, and right now our main consumer is, are the engines in in web browsers. So um, yeah, as Ben mentioned, this is part of the web platform. It's embedded into JavaScript, <laughs> but this is kind of only the first wave as far as we see it. We really we are really looking forward to other embeddings, and again, there are already people working on things like that. So standalone implementations of WebAssembly that you could use to, I don't know, write your own programming language in a, in a fairly simple way. You just have a runtime there already. Like people use the JVM, for example, to implement other languages. 
Um, and this would be completely independent of the web or even JavaScript, right? You don't need JavaScript for that. Um, and then there are also people working on embedding it in other environments, like, um, so there, there's, there are efforts to do some blockchain stuff with that, where you can put WebAssembly code on a blockchain, like Ethereum. They are thinking about moving to, to WebAssembly as their code format. I talked to some guys on Docker. They might they consider using it as their sandboxing uh, code format internally, and so on and so forth. There's a lot of stuff to to expect. Um, yeah, and this is goes into the goal that it's really platform independent. Um, so there are producers, consumers, um, and the contract between the two is the WebAssembly specification. And I want to briefly talk about that because. It is somewhat remarkable. There are actually two things that are remarkable about WebAssembly. The first is that, as, as far as we know, it's the first time that a technology like that was really uh, designed in collaboration between all the major browser vendors. I think that was is completely novel and hasn't happened before. And it was a very successful collaboration. The other um, a way in which uh, WebAssembly is remarkable from our perspective is uh, the way the rigor uh, the way it's rigorously specified. So we really wanted to set a new bar in terms of industrial language specifications. Um, so that means particularly that WebAssembly, the official language specification, comes with a complete formalized semantics. Um, so, and to explain what that means, I, I have to do my one minute rant about the poor state of uh, mainstream programming languages. So, I mean, Probably all of you know how to read a BNF grammar, right? So BNF grammars were invented with ALGOL 60. So it's like 60 years old uh, way to formally specify syntax. Um, but for, for semantics, basically, we're still stuck in the same decade. Like the way industrial languages are specified is still the same way they were specified 60 years ago, at least when it comes to industrial languages. And this is pretty sad because actually, at least in, in research and everywhere, we know how to do that right for at least 30 or 40 years, but it has never been adopted. And so we wanted really, we really wanted to change this game and use the state of the art standard techniques that are really standard in research. Everybody uses them there and employ them here. And this, one outcome of this is that you, when you do this in lockstep, the, the whole design and the formal specification, you actually arrive at a much cleaner and simpler design. Um, and it's not just uh, formalized on paper, we actually have a machine verified version of this formalization um, that we have put into a theorem prover and this theorem, and we have proved that the, the whole validation uh, provides us with a sound type soundness result that there's no undefined behavior in WebAssembly, that the sandbox is safe, and all these are results that are machine verified. Um, so, just want to flash this at you very briefly. So, this is from the paper ag again, which I already mentioned, um, just to make the point how clean and simple it is. So, don't worry if you can't read this and it's small anyway. But this is the entire execution semantics of WebAssembly. It's one page um, in a normal notation, uh, in a standard notation called structural operational semantics. So these are reduction rules. Don't worry about what they mean. It's just, and as a user, you probably never have to read them, but it's to make the point that it can actually be done and it leads to something very clean. And similarly, this is are the typing rules which specify, completely specify validation for WebAssembly. It's not even a full page. And you might be slightly more impressed by this um, if, you, if you're aware that the, the specification of bytecode verification for the JVM, for example, takes 160 pages. <laughs> Just keep that in mind. Okay, so this was about um, where WebAssembly is, where we came from, and I want to spend the rest uh, of, of my talk. How much time do I have left? Um, 10 minutes. Okay. Yeah, I, I don't think I need that long. Um, to, to say a little bit about where we're going next with WebAssembly, what's, what's coming down the road. And there are various things we're working on. One, obviously, is improving performance, which is natural. Um, 
We also want to improve tool support, obviously. So right now it's like very basic, right? I mean, you always start out with something very basic and um, the more people are starting to use it, the more pressure there will be to have better tools, I'm pretty sure. Um, and then I already mentioned that we, we're looking forward to seeing more languages um, and more, more platforms or embeddings. And probably the last, last group of things is more features inside WebAssembly itself. And the other, the other four I kind of, we already went through and uh, mentioned in the talk before, so I will focus on the last uh, point here for the rest of my presentation. So what are the future features? There are, there are a couple of proposals that are in the making for WebAssembly um, at different stages. So we have a whole process of how we, how we do um, proposals and you have to write it up as text and then you have to uh, write up the semantics in more detail. At some point you actually have to write up the formal semantics and you have to implement it in our reference interpreter. So we also have a reference interpreter that is written in, in OCaml and you have to write tests that this interpreter can run and all that. So there's a whole uh, list of things you have to do for a proposal and there are different stages in this, in this process. So one uh, proposal that's already pretty far along is support for threats and that actually doesn't for at least for now doesn't mean that you can spawn threats within WebAssembly itself but it means that a WebAssembly instance can be entered from different threats and can communicate through shared memory. So the main feature that this is adding here is primitives for atomic access to the to the linear memory. And that is important in particular for for people compiling their C++ code base to WebAssembly because that is the only way for them to emulate p-threads and everybody uses p-threads for games for example to, to uh, provide parallelism on a, in a low level way. So this is really important and I think this will be shipping relatively soon. Um, Another feature also important kind of for compiling C++, at least if you're compiling C++ with exception handling, is more uh, efficient support for exceptions. Right now it's actually the way you compile C++ exceptions to WebAssembly is you have to call back into JavaScript to have, do a handler there and it's like really awful. It's, it's horrible. So obviously we don't want that. But it's a bit more tricky to de design an exception mechanism in WebAssembly because it has to remain safe and it has to me remain safe even across different languages that are compiled into it and that don't understand how each other is using exceptions, right? So there, there are some things that you have to be careful about. Um, next one is uh, SIMD. Uh, so SIMD is something that all modern CPUs provide. It, it stands for single instruction multiple data. So these are vector instructions basically that can manipulate a whole vector of, of numbers at, at one time. And when you want to reach like the last 10% of performance for a computation intensive application, then you want to have access to, to SIMD capabilities of your, of your machine. So this is just adding a whole zoo of instructions that are individually not particularly interesting, but um, yeah, you get all of them. Um, and then one kind of thing, I lump several things here together, is better support in general for more high-level languages. So the initial design goal for WebAssembly, we explicitly cut it down to, okay, for version 1.0 we want to support C++ well. But it was always a goal that after that we want to broaden the support for more high-level languages. And that means um, having all sorts of features that maybe C++ doesn't really need or make much use of, but other languages might. For example, tail calls in particular, or the ability to mul return multiple values from a function and so on and so forth. And this is also not just to uh, support certain languages directly, but it's also uh, can support certain compilation techniques. Like I mentioned earlier that we want to support um, platforms running on top of WebAssembly that use, for example, jitting themselves, or imagine you want to implement a dynamic language like JavaScript, maybe even at some, some point in the future that uses all sorts of techniques to dynamically generate code and stuff. And for some of these, you need things like tail calls, for example, to make that efficient. So this is also like a compilation technique. Um, 
And then a big one, which is probably further out, is really, uh, let's phrase it as a support for garbage collection in a way. So Ben doesn't like that term. Uh, it's so negative. Garbage is good stuff. As Ben showed you right now, you only have this like four data types, right? This is like super primitive. You have to emulate everything yourself in a linear memory. And um, so if you wanted to compile a garbage collect language to, to WebAssembly, you can do that, but you have to ship it with your own runtime system, your own garbage collector, and which is probably not going to be super fast because this is kind of the use case where you pay most for the overhead that WebAssembly has. And it's kind of crazy too, I mean, at least on the web, you're already running in this engine that has this super tuned, uh, highly performant garbage collector, right? That has like 100 many years of work that went into it. So you should really be able to, to just use that. And the idea here is that we add new ways for defining basically struct types uh, in WebAssembly that you can then just create a value of and this value will be allocated on say the, the JavaScript heap actually. And then it will just be garbage collected when the last reference to it goes away. So this is still supposed to be a fairly low level mechanism so not like a heavyweight object model like you would have in the JVM or, or a .NET but really just basically tuples of values you can allocate or arrays. And then every language that wants to use it has to map its own object model into these data structures. But still it provides the, the convenience and the performance of built-in garbage collection. Yeah, and another uh, part of that is the, the first item there is um, the ability to actually use pass in references from the host environment like on the web DOM objects for example into JavaScript. Right now you can't do that, right? You only have numbers. So what you have to do right now if you want to interface with the DOM you have to build some bijection on the boundary that maps uh, the, the objects you want to manipulate to some numbers that you use internally to identify them. And then you have to worry about like how do you do the, the, the cross-boundary garbage collection and all that. So this is pretty, uh, yeah, it's not very nice. Um, so with if you have garbage collection inside WebAssembly itself, <laughs> you could just pass in references. Uh, and the last point item here is we want to have better support for host bindings. So right now, yeah, you have a, a WebAssembly function, you can export it. But it can only take numbers as arguments, right? So if you want to interface with JavaScript, it, th this type doesn't even tell you whether these numbers are supposed to be interpreted as signed or unsigned. So what we want to add is um, some description annotation language in the binary format, like a new custom section basically that describes some binding mechanism to JavaScript in this case, where it says how the values are converted between JavaScript and WebAssembly. And this also gives you a way to deal with strings, for example. The only way to pass in strings right now is you have to somehow expose the linear memory of WebAssembly to JavaScript and then copy bytes into it. Because there are no string objects, right? And so this could all be taken care of more or less automatically by, the, by this binding layer. Right, so that's uh, roughly it. Um, brief summary, what's the point of this, all this, yeah mention it. It's, it's supposed to be a, a new code format with all the nice properties you want to have. Um, it already runs in all the browsers and probably beyond in the future. Actually there are even more browsers it's running in. I know that it's already uh, available in Opera as well because that is just based on, on Chromium and some other browser, browsers based on Chromium. Um, yeah, and we, we made a point of making this design and its whole specification and the whole proposal evolution process really, really rigorous. Much more rigorous than anything you've seen so far in industrial languages. So, hopefully this uh, opens up a whole new world of things you can do on the web, uh, including breaking it. <laughs> and uh, yeah, so there's a web page too if you want to look up. Uh, more information. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. So I got an, uh, a few questions. Well, some of them are around: uh, Is it already production ready? Can I use it in uh, in enterprise uh, development? 
And uh, what about versions? Uh, do we have to expect some issues with different versions of WebAssembly? Can you say something about that? Sure. Uh, yeah, we consider this to be, we shipped it in stable Chrome. We sh uh, it's been shipped in stable Firefox. So yeah, you can use it in enterprise apps and people are compiling huge engines. So the Epic engine, which is like something like 200 megabytes, is already been compiled to WebAssembly and people are shipping stuff that makes money with WebAssembly. Um, so the other part was? Uh, what about versions, different what versions and binary compatibility? <laughs> Yeah, so one design goal was actually to make the binary format uh, forward compatible. So the idea is we, we have a version flag in there, but the idea is that we never have to bump it. <laughs> um, so this is really just an escape hatch. So anything we want to add, we, we add in the future should be uh, backwards compatible. So just adding new things that were just invalid before. And then you could use some form of feature detection like you use in JavaScript as well to find out whether your browser already supports that. So you can, one way you can do that is you just generate like a tiny little module um, that uses the feature you want. And then you call in, in the JavaScript API, there's a validate function, for example. You just try to validate it on the browser. And if it says yes, then you can use it. And if it says no, then you have to fall back to something else. Okay. Uh, then quite a lot of questions regarding which languages will be supported, are supported, and so on. I also see a few questions about whether Java will be supported. Do you know any Java project that tries to compile Java to WebAssembly? Uh, currently, no. We don't know about anybody that's using Java with WebAssembly. So about, in general, because WebAssembly is a machine, it's, there's this implicit or explicit separation between what languages run on top and what the what the engine has specified. So we've completed the implementation of the engine. So as long as you can generate bytecode which conforms to that spec, then any language will run. As far as the reality of what languages run, C and C++ run by using Inscripten. Uh, Rust has essentially a beta backend for that. Uh, assembly script is, is more like a more like a layer on top of WebAssembly. But other languages are coming. I think. Specifically for Java, is probably going to require the managed objects proposal, so that's probably a couple years out. But as you saw, WebAssembly is a low-level machine. In order to bring a high-level language, you have to compile the high-level language away or compile part of it to JavaScript, for example. How does it relate to LLVM? You can consider WebAssembly to be a portable binary format. So as was mentioned, Pinnacle was a... It was a Google, Google technology that uses LVM bitcode as a transportation format. You can consider WebAssembly to be sort of the delivery of that promise. LVM is a compiler framework, but it also has like, uh, it has a bitcode format that you can use for various purposes. Okay. And uh, one, was, uh, one question was there, is there already something like Node.js or uh, for WebAssembly? That one of the platform. Well, that would mean compiling JavaScript to WebAssembly, right? <laughs> or you mean support in Node.js for WebAssembly? Yeah, probably. Yeah. yeah. So I think the current Node.js version is on what what V8 version? As soon as it reaches the right V8 version, it will be yeah. there implicitly, right? I mean, I think it okay. already is. I don't know exactly what V8 version. Yeah, is. I think uh, the latest Node has already shipped V8 5.8, which includes WebAssembly by default. So yeah. Okay, so it's included. Any other questions which are not on here? Okay, then, thanks a lot.